So today we are going to continue the discussion about pruning and sparsity. So in last lecture, uh, we have go through the basics of pruning. And in this lecture, we are going to cover uh, these more advanced technologies, right? So how do you select the pruning ratio, right? The deep neural net has many different layers. VGG has 16 layers, Resin 50 has 50 layers. Are all the layers equal? Do you prune them in a similar sparsity ratio for each layer? That's actually not the case. And how do we select the sparsity ratio for each layer, right? That's the first topic. And then how to fine tune to recover the accuracy, right? Do you increase the learning rate, decrease the learning rate? How to uh, do that? Do you prune everything at once? Do you do them gradually? So that's how to fine tune the prune model. Next, we are going to introduce this lottery ticket hypothesis, okay? Which is showing that training a sparse neural network from scratch uh, is sometimes possible, right? Um, and finally, how do we realize those speed up, okay, by pruning using different granularities, specialized hardware? We will talk about that in the later part of this lecture, okay? So just go through what we have learned. What, what are, where are we now, right? We have already covered these three points. So what is pruning, reducing neurons, reducing the weights, okay? And determining the uh, pruning granularity from fine grain pruning, where you can prune more, to the coarse grain pruning, pruning criterion, and now we are here, okay? Determining the criterion ratio, and then also fine tune a pruned neural net. So pruning, basically removing synapses and neurons, just as the overview, getting pretty popular in recent years. And it has been widely adopted by the industry. For example, if you have an A100 GPU, sparsity, two to four sparsity, is already supported over there. Okay, and uh, Zilinks also using that. Um, so we talk about the uh, setup, which is basically minimizing the loss function subject to the number of non-zero weights should be smaller than the threshold. And we discuss the different granularities of pruning from the fine grain to the, uh, to the coarse grain, where we can prune the most, where it's easiest to, uh, to accelerate. Here we require specialized accelerators to accelerate versus um, uh, how to select which synapses to prune, the magnitude-based pruning, which is the most popular these days, right? Based on the magnitude for different granularities, okay, which is the most popular approach. And also how to select which neurons to prune. Again, magnitude-based approach is very effective. So now let's switch gear to a new chapter to uh, determine uh, the pruning ratio, okay? So what would be the... Um, sparsity for each layer, and how do we select the sparsity, okay? Um, so let's brainstorm a little bit. Given a deep neural network, okay, the shallower layers interact with the low-level features, right? Finding the edges, the corners, and deeper layers is finding more abstract information. Which layer do you think has more redundancy? The shallower layer or the deeper layer? Deeper layer, and why is that the case? Yeah, they, they have contain more abstract features, different images may be different, maybe there's more redundancy and there are more weights, more channels in the in the later layers. Yeah, that's a very good guess. Right? So without a um uh, uh, heuristic, right? We we can come up with different heuristics which require a lot of hand tuning. Right? So let's see, um, should we uh, uniform shrink versus not uniformly uh, shrink the model? So here we compare uniformly shrink all the layers using the same sparsity ratio versus channel pruning. Some layers we get pruned more, some layers we get pruned less. And it's exactly like you mentioned the deeper layers usually contain more redundancy and can be more aggressively pruned, especially if a neural net has many FC layers. Usually, those FC layers can be aggressively pruned, while the earlier layers, the shallower layers, especially the first layer, is usually more difficult to prune. Okay? Uh, so this is giving some intuition about this latency versus uh, this accuracy uh, trade-off. Ideally, we want to, which point do we want? 
lower latency, higher accuracy, right? Ideally, we want this point. Um, so uh, using this um, smartly selecting the pruning ratio versus just uniformly scaling each layer, that can matter a lot, differs a lot, right? For example, uh, these two models both has about 70 millisecond latency on a mobile CPU, but if we smartly select the pruning uh, ratio for each channel, it could be uh, uh, like 2% difference with respect to the tau point image and accuracy, right? showing the importance of selecting the proper uh, pruning ratio for each layer. And then the question is, how do we find the ratios for each layer? So we can do some heuristic, like early layer we prune less, late layer we prune more by trial and error. Imagine you have like 50 layers. There will be so many choices. Even if you have um, like 10%, 20%, 30%, 50%, 50%, 50%, if you multiply your choices by the number of layers, that's like n to the power of n, right? So that's a huge amount of choices. So let's do some heuristics. We can analyze the sensitivity okay, of each layer. What is sensitivity? You prune it a little bit and see how does accuracy drop. You continue prune a little bit more, see how does accuracy drop, and then do a more aggressive pruning. If the layer is less sensitive, basically you can prune a lot without losing accuracy. But if it's very sensitive, you prune a little bit, and then drastically the accuracy begins to drop. Then for that layer, you want to prune less. Okay, that's the simple heuristic we have here. So let's uh, run this layer by layer and see uh, how does that happen. So here we prune on this Recipher data set using uh, the starter code user in our lab. Um, or maybe this is the, okay, so let's start with the original, original neural network. Okay, so, so which has accuracy, it's pretty good accuracy, okay, um, about 90% accuracy. And then uh, for uh, the first layer, uh, we gradually prune like 30%, 40%, 50%, 60%, and then the accuracy begins to drop uh, pretty quick, right? So uh, under 90% uh, of pruning ratio, this is the drop of the accuracy. It's pretty um, sensitive. Let's see another layer, okay? So this is the, uh, this is the second layer, L1, L0, L1, layer 0, layer 1, okay? This layer is less sensitive until like 70% of pruning, where basically we are removing 70% of the parameters. But the accuracy is still well maintained in this case. Okay? Until like 90%, you still drop a very little bit, right? So which means this layer can probably be pruned more. Of course, there are limitations for this method. Well, I walk, walk you through all the layers. Please think about what is the limitation for this method. What, what did I ignore so far? The correlation between the layers. Yes, that's one of them, right? I am currently analyzing each layer individually, right? And there's one more thing. Um, I will talk about that. So, um, and then let's see more layers, okay, L3. Okay, and here is the sensitivity for all the layers. Okay. So uh, some of the layers, like this green layer, is less sensitive to pruning. You can prune a lot without hurting accuracy. Some of the layers are pretty sensitive to pruning, so we should prune less. Then how do we choose the pruning ratio? So let's just give a threshold. Say we want to lose uh, no more than like 5% or 10% of the accuracy. We cut through this sensitivity map and see where is the intersection. Okay? Um, and the intersection indica indicates the sparsity we want to get. For example, for this blue layer, which is really sensitive, we just cut here, which is about 72, 75% of pruning ratio. Well, for these less sensitive layer, we can prune more, like more than 80% uh, in this case. Is this optimal? Of course not, because we are considering each layer independently. 
assuming the accuracy drop is uh, edible with each other, okay? But actually, they uh, tightly inter interact with each other, each other. So this is the trade-off between how many experiments you want to do versus the approximation. In real world, even in designing Cervitas AI tool or many uh, Intel uh, uh, Nvidia pruning tools, this is a very widely used uh, heuristic. So if you want to design chips, you want to do some pruning for acceleration, feel free to use this method. It's very robust and easy to do. And can we go beyond these heuristics? Is there a more automated approach that consider um, the holistic, the whole neural network? So we are going to learn that next. And before moving forward, what is the other limitation if you are targeting the full, uh, the, the overall better pruning ratio? What is missing here? So far we talk about the sensitivity, the accuracy perspective, we want to make sure we don't lose too much accuracy for those sensitive layers. What other factors should we consider? Which one should we prune more? Size exactly, the size of the layers, right? So for example, uh, this green layer, even it's very unsensitive, but if it has only a little amount of parameters, pruning that doesn't help us too much. We may as well not pruning that too aggressively, right? But for this, like this red layer, although it's pretty, um, uh, pretty uh, sensitive, but it contributes, say, if it contributes 90% of the parameters, that will help a lot if we just prune it a little bit, right? So that's another factor we want to consider when doing uh, such pruning. So that adds the complexity about the decision making. So uh, an automated approach is very crucial. Question. Is it ever possible that accuracy is too simple of a metric to be looking at? So we're like, if you prune too much, but nine out of your 10 classes are fine, but one is absolutely demolished. Like, Graven and Jen is no longer good at recognizing cards in the board. Right. Um, so designing a proper uh, reward is super crucial. Whether you uh, decide the uh, reward to be the, the just the accuracy or the, you have weighted accuracy for individual classes, like a certain class would be super important, right? Or you want to have the um, false positive versus uh, false negative, and you want to reduce them uh, as your end goal, right? So you want to plug in uh, a proper metric. Accuracy is a good metric, but very limited. Right? Other metrics also include, like we introduced in the first lecture, the number of weights, the amount of computation, the size of the activation, those are all the metrics to consider when you are doing the pruning, depend on, on your use scenario. For example, if I just care about the model size, care about if I upload to Apple Store, how long does it take for users to download the model? Then the model size matters, accuracy matters. But if I care about the inference speed, the latency, then um, the, the, the flops matters and also the uh, amount of data movement matters, right? So that's a good point for different uh, uh, award, rewards to consider. Okay, so um, next, which motivates us to, uh, the complicated design space motivates us to do such more automated pruning approaches, right? So given an overall compression ratio, how do we choose the per layer pruning ratio? since the sensitivity analysis ignores the intersection, interaction between the layers. And if we have just um, people doing such, such work, if you have a couple of customers requiring uh, a model, but maybe three engineers can serve three customers, but if we have so many uh, customers, we'll be relying on a lot of engineering efforts to fine tune, to, to find the best solution. So this kind of automated approach have a push the button solution, let the machines do the job rather than let, uh, let engineers do the job is a way to solve this issue, okay? So traditionally, such pruning require both machine learning expert and also hardware expert, since you want to understand uh, the, the library, the operator support, which layer is efficient, what is the uh, cache size, etc. And also uh, we want to enable this non-expert to have a push the button solution to enable this efficient neural net design, okay? bridge the gap with this auto ML 
approaches. With that, we uh, propose this auto ML for model compression, right? So rather than letting human to decide which layer prune how much, now we want to have an agent to automatically figure out how much we prune for each layer, right? Um, so here we use a reinforcement learning agent to uh, do the job. Okay, so here we have several components. Uh, we have a critique, we have an actor, we have an embedding. Okay, so critique, we want to make sure, uh, we want to know if this is a good policy or it is a uh, bad policy. Okay, so we want to uh, clearly define the uh, reward function. A mo uh, the simplest reward function would be uh, the error rate, right? We want to have a, a low error rate. However, that's not enough. Uh, we also want to penalize a lot of uh, long latency or a long flops. Okay? We also want to penalize a large model size. Right? So you can add different terms uh, in the reward function. Okay? And what is the action? So action here is the sparsity ratio for each layer. For example, the first layer, second layer, third layer, 30%, 50%. What is the sparsity ratio for each layer? And we also need to know the embedding of the neural net, since the architecture of the neural net uh, determines uh, the proving policy, right? So we want to encode those embeddings like N, C, H, W, and the index of the layer. Okay, we want to put them into the feature so that the agent can uh, use this feature uh, to give uh, the, the action. Okay. So in this way, um, it uses the following setups for the reinforcement learning agent. So when we are designing, designing the states, okay, so there are 11 features, including the layer indices, this first layer or second layer, number of channels, kernel size, and flops. Okay. And action is basically the pruning ratio for each layer. Okay. It's a continuous number. That's why we use the DDPG agent. Um, the agent itself is beyond the lecture of this, uh, this course. If you are taking a reinforcement learning course, uh, you will learn about this agent. Since uh, it supports a continuous action output rather than like up, down, left, left, right. This is a continuous output, a sparsity ratio between zero and one. Okay? And the reward would be uh, if they satisfy your model size constraint, it will be minus the error. Why minus? We want to encourage lower error rate. So lower error rate will give you higher reward. Or if it doesn't satisfy your constraint, say uh, you have a one megabyte limit of model size, but it, after pruning is still two megabytes, then the reward is four, uh, neg uh, this, uh, negative in infinite. Okay. We can also optimize for latency okay, with a pre-built latency lookup table. So this is comparing the human pruned model versus auto ML prune model. Okay, so this is ResNet 50 on ImageNet. So um, this one is actually from my PhD thesis where I spent almost a week to figure out what should we prune for each layer. Okay, from different hand tuning adjustment, spent a week. Uh, I located the pruning ratio for different layer. I got it 29%. Okay, it's pretty good. It's three times smaller. But what if we use uh, this AMC agent? So within just a couple of GPU hours, we can prune it to only uh, 20 percent. Okay, a much more automated, much automated than human, and also achieve a much better um, pruning ratio. And what's most interesting is that it, it finds the patterns that really make sense. So this is the uh, pruning policy, which is the sparsity ratio for different layers, altogether 50 layers for ResNet 50. Okay, and this is the sparsity, the density, actually the density, the percentage of non-zeros. Okay, so here means uh, very sparse, here means less sparse. You have a lot of non-zeros versus you have very little non-zeros. Um, so for different stages, stages one, two, three, four, we use different color to color them. Okay, different stage means different resolution in ResF 50. And we can observe something in common for different stages. Okay, so there are those peaks versus crests. Okay, so what are those crests? They are those three by three convolutions. Okay, and they are pruned more or pruned less for those for those layers. Are they more 
aggressively pruned or are they less aggressively pruned compared with those uh, one by one? They are more aggressively pruned, right? So they have a, a less number of nine zeros, so they are pruned more. Uh, because three by three, of course, uh, has a larger kernel size, you have more redundancy, but we never teach the agent such rules. Uh, through trial and error, it automatically find that we should prune more for those three by three convolutions and prune less for those one by one convolutions, okay? which is quite interesting. And let's see, what if we can uh, prune this uh, mobile net? Uh, the original Mac is about 570. Uh, latency is running about 120 milliseconds on the mobile phone. This is a Samsung phone. Uh, if we reduce 50% of the flops, the accuracy is well maintained, dropped by 0.1%, but it's 1.8 times faster. Okay? And the memory consumption is also, also smaller. What if we uh, use this latency constraint? We can use 50% uh, time. Uh, we can see immediately uh, the latency is reduced by half, okay? and uh, the uh, top point accuracy is also pretty well, pretty well maintained. Versus if we naively just linearly scale all the layers by 0 0.75, we get worse accuracy and also um, longer latency, which is showing such uh, automated approach is better than just purely linearly scale all the layers. Okay. Let me introduce another approach to automatically find how much should we prune for each layer called a net adapt. Okay. Uh, the goal of net adapt is similar. Find the best per layer pruning ratio to meet the global constraint. Okay. Um, let's use uh, this as an example, given a four layer neural net to start with. Okay. So we want to define a uh, delta R, okay? so prune the layers. We, uh, we want to make sure we have a latency reduction of delta R. We try um, different layers. For example, for first layer, how much do we prune such that we can meet this latency reduction of delta R? We prune more aggressively. Finally, we can meet this delta R target. Okay, and then we uh, record what is the accuracy uh, in this case by a short term of fine tuning to see what is the loss of accuracy. And then we try the second layer, uh, prune it a little bit until we can reach this delta R latency reduction. Fine tune it a little bit and see what is the accuracy drop. Until we finish that for all the layers, we observe for which layer we can observe the lowest job of accuracy. Okay? Then we decide to prune that layer in order to meet this delta R latency constraint. Okay? So we repeat this process by pruning uh, by reducing delta R, two delta R, three delta R. Okay, each time we want to go through all the layers, try each layer until it reaches this delta R reduction, and then see uh, fine-tune a little bit to see which layer has the lowest loss of accuracy given delta R latency reduction. Okay? So in that case, um, those layers that are least sensitive will be pruned more. Okay? So we repeat this process until the total latency reduction satisfies this constraint. And this method also consistently outperform uh, the different methods like directly multiply uh, the, the models by 0 0.75 or 0 0.5, okay? All right, so we now learn how to specify the sparsity ratio. Okay, we learned three methods. First method is by this sensitivity analysis, which is very simple, very quick, uh, but doesn't capture these inter interactions between the layers. The second method is AMC approach using reinforcement learning agent to figure out the best sparsity ratio Finally, net adapt. To use this per layer uh, delta R uh, analysis to see which layer has the least drop of accuracy. Uh, and then let's learn about how to fine tune and train a sparse and pruned neural network and how do we recover the accuracy 
after pruning. Okay. Um, a very key point when we are fine tuning the model is that we need to decrease the learning rate. So um, since we already the model is already well trained, it almost converged, right? But we notched it away from this local minimum. Uh, but we usually require one uh, one percent or uh, ten percent of the original learning rate while we are fine tuning uh, the model. So this is showing the effect uh, before fine tuning. Okay, so we have seen this one. Eighty percent we uh, have a lot of accuracy drop, but with proper fine tuning, we can fully recover the accuracy even uh, with eighty percent of pruning ratio. It's showing improve. Uh, Retraining is super important. Okay, and a good practice is do not prune the model directly to the target sparsity you want. Right? Let's say my target sparsity is um, uh, is ninety percent. Do not just one step go to ninety percent, but you wanna uh, step by step. Okay, prune a little bit and fine tune it. Prune a little bit and then fine tune it. So we wanna. Prune it 30%, fine tune it, 50%, fine tune it, and then 70% and fine tune it, which is a pretty good practice, such that we can arrive at this uh, red curve rather than uh, this green curve. And during uh, fine tuning, we want to add regularization to encourage the weights um, uh, to, uh, when tuning the model, we want to encourage the weights to be closer to zero so that it will be easier to prune them, right? So how do we encourage the weights to be closer to zero? We can add those regularization terms, okay? So we wanna penalize those non-zero parameters by either L1 or L2 regularization. So L1 regularization, you wanna add this uh, uh, lambda W versus lambda W square for uh, these two regularizations. And these two uh, methods are both very popular in literature and in practice. So uh, magnitude-based fine-tuning applies this L2 regularizations. Other approaches, other papers use uh, L1 regularization. So in our practice, we use this, um, this, uh, this regularization a little bit more. But in, in practice, they work uh, pretty much uh, equal in, in both scenarios. Okay, so. Now we have covered the whole uh, recipe uh, for pruning, okay? determine the granularity, criterion, pruning ratio, and how to fine tune and retrain the model. Any questions so far? Okay, good. Then let's make, continue making the progress. So let's talk about some recent literature um, about lottery ticket hypothesis. Okay, can we train a sparse neural network from scratch? Right. So far, uh, we find um, the neural network can be compressed, right? can be reduced. Um, but can we directly train this sparse neural network from the beginning? Right? So far, we have to train the model to, to understand which weight can be pruned. Can we directly train this sparse neural network from scratch? Okay. Uh, some contemporary experience tells us the architectures uncovered by pruning are harder to train from start, reaching lower latency uh, accuracy than the original networks. So there are, this is comparison between uh, two models, okay? uh, on the MNIST data set versus on the uh, CIFAR data set, but there's a describing similar uh, observation. So the dash line is basically randomly sampled sparse neural networks. You have a dense network, you ram randomly sample a subset of the sparse neural net. Um, the, the more um, you prune, actually, the lower the accuracy. But there's a solid line that is while maintaining the accuracy, even with very aggressive pruning ratio. What is that line? So you apply the correct sparsity mask. Okay? And how do we uh, talk about, uh, obtain this mask? I will talk about later. And use the same initialization okay, as you are training the model, so initially you are initializing the model, okay, and you train it all the way to the end. When it converges, you find which weight is large. You keep those weights, 
So you know the sparsity pattern. Those important weights are the winning tickets. They have a mask of one. Then you apply this, this the same mask to the beginning when that network gets trained in the beginning. So you use that mask, the same initialization you're training to the end. You can ob obtain this line that can have a pretty good accuracy, um, even with only like 1%, 1 percent, 1.2 percent of the, the weights remaining. Okay. So in summary, here uh, we we can recover the accuracy um, by using this lottery ticket hypothesis, which is basically saying a randomly initialized dense neural network okay, contain a subnetwork, a subnetwork that is initialized such that when trained in isolation, it can match the test accuracy of the original network after training uh, for at most the same number of iterations. So this is just a, an illustration. We have a randomly initialized model. The initialization is colored in light blue, okay? and we train it for T epochs, and then the, the weight becomes uh, the dark blue, and uh, the winning ticket is basically saying uh, we find we, uh, we find the magnitude of the trained model. Okay, we keep those large magnitude weights, so those are the winning tickets. Those magnitude that are large, after training, you have to train it to the end to find those winning tickets. And those winning tickets, you want to initialize the original uh, weight using uh, this light blue color, showing that it's not reusing that weight, that converged weight, but you are using this initialized weight, but apply this sparsity mask, okay, and you can trim um, this model for at most T epochs, you can uh, obtain the same accuracy as before. So this is the illustration. We are initializing the model, we train it, and then we prune it based on the magnitude. We prune away those small magnitude weights. Okay? And then we uh, re, uh, reinitialize the model using the same initialization and using that sparsity pattern. Okay? Observe that model and this model, they have the same sparsity pattern, but they have different weights. That weights are uh, is during converge, is already converged, but this is the initialized weight. Okay? So use this weight, but use that sparsity pattern. And then we train it, and then we prune it more. So notice that um, the sparsity of this model it is already more sparse than this one. Like this edge is this edge is removed in that case. We gradually prune more during this case, and then we uh, apply the same sparsity mask during convergence to this model. Okay, so it becomes sparser. But using the same initialization, this is light blue, not dark blue. This is light blue as the original model. And then we can train it. Finally, we can obtain the same accuracy, although this model has the same accuracy, uh, small, much smaller than the beginning model. So the uh, tricky part is we still have to train the model uh, when it converges to get, in order to get uh, this sparsity mask. Okay, so um, the, there is a scaling uh, limitation where resetting the weights to the very initial initial value okay, works for those small scale tasks like MNIST and Cypher, but on um, uh, the deeper networks on, on, on ImageNet, it actually does not work. But instead, it is possible to robustly obtain a pruned set uh, sub network by resetting the weights not to T zero. But, but after a small number of k training iterations, which we need to manually explore, um, rather than rewinding everything to wt equal to zero, we want to reset it to wt equals to k, okay? um, so that we can still uh, recover the accuracy on large scale data sets like ImageNet. So this is showing like rewinding to uh, epoch zero, the accuracy. Uh, is decreasing pretty fast, but if we rewind it to uh, um, uh, iteration uh, iteration six, okay, to epoch six, we can better recover the uh, the accuracy. So the total number of training epochs is ninety, 
but we are reminding to IPOC 6. Uh, how big an effect does the data set have on this cartoon? Uh, so for the, how does the data set scale matters for the, uh, for the mask? So like uh. one Actually, it's quite different, exactly. So like ImageNet, you see the sparsity pattern, you lose accuracy when you are reaching like 16%. But on MNIST, if you go back, um, the sparsity ratio is actually really aggressive, like one or 2%. And on Sci-Fi 10, it's like 7%-ish. So the sparsity, it really, depend, really depends on the complexity of your data set. So ImageNet is very complicated, so it makes sense where we can prune less. Well, MNIST is so simple. Like in the last lecture, in our demo, right, we can prune all the way to like 90, 95%, 99%, right? So it's really dependent on the data set. Let's continue to talk about the algorithm hardware co-design uh, and also the system support for uh, for sparsity. So conventional paradigm is that you train the model, okay, and then you obtain the, the model and you directly de deploy the model for inference. So what's the drawback for that? So we are using uh, this convex optimization, right, which is SGD to deal with such a highly non-convex model, which is the neural nets. So a lot of redundancy and over-parameterization is actually required to make sure we can have a good uh, convergence, right? But actually, the model is super uh, over-parameterized, very inefficient for inference. So if we directly deploy that, it will go going to consume a lot of unnecessary memory and computation, which could be uh, super slow on mobile devices. So uh, a better approach, a better better paradigm is actually after training, you do not directly uh, deploy your model for production, but rather you want to compress the model and remove those redundancies, remove those over over parameterization, get a more compact model, and then uh, run it through accelerated inference with specialized hardware, which is fast and also um, is more power efficient. So here we um, have three uh, very fundamental rules. Okay? So uh, anything multiplied by zero is zero, right? So if you observe any of the uh, weight is zero. You don't have to compute the computation, right? And after radu function, if the activation is zero, you also don't have to multiply that. And thirdly, for deep neural nets, we don't need that high precision, like 2.09, 1.92. You just approximate everything uh, by two okay, using quantization, which we are going to cover in Thursday's, Thursday's lecture. So we want to take advantage of those weight sparsity, okay? Weight sparsity, 90% of the weight are zero. So you want to definitely uh, not multiply, uh, save the computation, right, by 10x, but save 5x less memory footprint. Why is less compared with the computation? Since we, we need metadata to represent um, the sparse matrix, you know, we want to store not only the weight, but also the index or the bit mask. Okay? Uh, worst case, it will be around uh, 2x less compared with the saving of the computation. And also for the uh, activation, uh, we usually can get like, like almost 70%. This is run through, uh, this is due to the redo function, where after redo, you get a, a free food for many zeros. Okay? But this is dynamic where Compared with weight sparsity, we're after pruning. No matter which image, which input comes into inference, the sparsity pattern is the same. But for the activation, the, act, uh, the sparsity is determined at the runtime. Okay, so that's the difference. So you cannot actually save uh, the, the memory due to you don't know what is the sparsity pattern, um, but you can uh, achieve less computation. Um, maybe future can also do. Smarter ideas can also enable uh, saving for the activation since uh, you can use smarter data structures to, uh, to represent those activations. And finally, by uh, weight sharing or quantization, we can easily quantize the neural nets to four bits uh, 
for the weights only. Okay, so that saves about uh, eight times compared with uh, the 32-bit floating point representation, uh, which we are going to dive deeper into next lecture for quantization weight sharing. So after pruning, okay, so the weight sparse, uh, the weight matrix becomes super sparse. Okay, so here is we have a vector of size four. And the mat matrix is eight by four. Okay, uh, you see lots of the weights are actually pruned to be zero. Okay, this is a simplified um, uh, matrix. Okay, and the output. This is the bias for the output, and the output dimension is eight in this scenario. Okay, so an eight by four matrix. Input is a four by one, and output is eight by one. Okay, uh, so we want to analyze how do we parallelize and how do we uh, skip those zeros, okay? So efficient inference engine is the first accelerator that can take advantage of the weight sparsity for pruned, uh, pruned neural network with the weight sparsity. So we first uh, map it to different uh, processing elements, okay? So each color indicates a different processing element. So here in this example, we have four processing elements, okay? And the first process, PE is responsible for the first row and also the uh, uh, fifth row. Okay, the second one is responsible for the second row and also the sixth row. Okay, so so on and so on. Okay, and physically they are stored in this way. Okay, so the, for the matrix, um, for example, given PE zero, uh, which is the uh, the green PE. So we want to only store those non-zero elements, in this case, W00, and then W01, W42, and W03, and W43, okay? Um, and also, uh, we want to store those relative index. What is their position? So the first one is actually zero, and then W01 is immediately after that, okay? So we put a number one, okay? So W42, uh, which is here, we have an, uh, you have two, two zeros in between this W01 and W42. So we have uh, number two. And then W03 is immediately after this W42. Therefore, we have uh, zero. So this is showing the relative index, the, the, the gap between the previous non-zero and the current non-zero. And why do we use such relative index rather than the absolute index? Less storage. Yeah, exactly. So if the absolute value is pretty large, like you have uh, 4K, you, you need many bits to represent the re uh, absolute index. But using this relative jump, this difference, you can use fewer number of bits. And finally, you have the column pointer. Okay? You want to show... Um, where does which which is the starting point and end point for each column? So you have uh, four columns. You have five numbers. So you want to indicate not only the starting point but also the end point for um, for each column. Okay. Uh, so for example, in column zero, we have only one element. Therefore, immediately the starting point of the second column is location number one. Okay, W zero one. And the starting point for the third column is number two, which is W42. Okay, so that is the column pointer. This is how we represent uh, the sparse matrix. This is adapted version of the CAC, compressed sparse column format. And now you understand why the memory saving is less than, if you prune it by 90%, the saving of memory is less than 10x because you have this metadata to store, not only those non-zero weights. Okay. Any question? Uh, I didn't quite understand. Why, why do we start with the first row and then suddenly go down to the second, three second row and then second, Rather than this row, right? So we are having different processing elements. Yeah. So this is one group, and this is a copy of another group, and a copy of another group. Yeah. Mm. But why do we order the first row by this way? Oh, so this correspond to PE0. So this is the green PE, and this is also corresponding to the same PE. All the PEs are processing elements in lockstep. So um, 
you will have a same copy for PE1 uh, for this purple PE, right? Another uh, similarly for the for the blue PE. Yeah, this is just one uh, of out of four uh, processing elements. Why do you use the column pointer? You can manually calculate it right from the related number. Uh, for the column pointer, you don't know. Um, which one is corresponding to the starting point of a new column, right? You, you know the distance between uh, the, the different, um, you know the number, uh, the distance between different uh, non-zero weights, right? For example, W01 and W42, W01 and W42 differ by uh, two locations, but you don't know whether it's a new row, new column, or it is an old column. Uh, so you don't know actually how many rows you have. So here we didn't have any number indicating in this case we have two rows. Okay, so the data flow to ignore zero is like this. So we started with the activation. We observe whether the input is zero. If it is zero, then we skip that. Okay, if it is a non-zero, okay, like a one, if it's non-zero. Then we are going to uh, broadcast this non-zero weight to uh, all the different PEs. Okay, so they are processed. Uh, they are broadcasted to all the PEs, and then in log in parallel, they are multiplied and added with a bias, and then update the output. We encounter another zero. What do we do with that? We uh, skip that. We skip the entire column, not having to do any computation on this zero activation so that we can take advantage of not only the weight sparsity but also the activation sparsity. If the activation after right away is zero, then it doesn't have to be multiplied with any element with the with the whole column. Okay. And after that we multiply we find another non-zero element. So we broadcast it to um, all the PEs that has non-zero element. Okay. Actually the first cycle we updated the first half and the second cycle, we, we handle the second half. Okay? And finally, uh, we update the, the output. So in order to support that data flow, uh, this is the microarchitecture for each processing element to uh, accelerate such sparse um, uh, and prune model. So we have activation queue. Okay? So different, we can see different PEs, they may have different number of non zeros. So we want to make sure that they are balanced and make some buffer. Okay? And then we um, deal with this activation sparsity by examining whether uh, the output is zero, uh, the input is zero. Okay? If it is non-zero, then we pass it through the weight matrix. Okay? We have, just now like we mentioned, we have this uh, uh, column start and end address and also the sparse uh, weight matrix. So we find those non-zero elements and then decode the weight. Uh, so we will talk about that in the next lecture about weight sharing and weight decoding. And then for the address, remember we are having this storing those relative index. Therefore, we need to accumulate them to get the absolute uh, index. And then we do the, the multiplication and add. And we also have the address in parallel. Therefore, we can store it into the corresponding location and update the output uh, as RAM. Okay? So the, actually, the key computation is just multiplication and add, but we have to do a lot of uh, actual work to um, guide uh, where, where, should we, uh, where, where should we read and where should we write. Okay? And finally, we pass it through the radio unit and detect if it is zero or non-zero. Even if it's non-zero, we are going to put it in the activation queue of the next stage. Okay. So the special part is the activation queue. We want to do load balance, and also uh, we have the weight decoder uh, to turn a four-bit quantized index into a 16-bit real weight value, and also this address accumulator um, to turn a, a relative index into a absolute index. So this is the uh, layout of the efficient inference engine. And this is the sparsity ratio for, uh, yeah, you can handle FC layers only. 
Okay, so this is the FC layers for LX net. Weight sparsity, high division sparsity, this is the flop reduction by multiplying the weight density with the activation density. So these are the FC layers of the VGG model. These are the uh, image um, capture model, the neural talk. Okay. So uh, we observe that why the activation density for these are, are 100. Actually, they don't use red wolf. That's the reason we don't have the activation sparsity uh, for these um, uh, image capture models. Okay, so they are using sigmoid. That's why we have less flop reduction for for these models. Okay, and it's pretty decent speed up compared with uh, the CPU and GPU. Um, and these models are actually compressed. So even on the CPU, running the compressed model can have a, a pretty big advantage over the non-compressed model. So this is measured on the FC layer of uh, NXNet, VGG, and the neural talk. And this is comparing the uh, energy efficiency of CPU, GPU, mobile GPU, and the efficient inference engine. And we can find, in general, uh, running the compressed model has a pretty big advantage over the non-compressed model. So this is an early prototype back in 2015, 7, uh, and 16. But a couple of years later, in 2021, when um, NVIDIA A100 came out, this technique has been uh, solidly commercialized in NVIDIA GPU, where we, uh, it, it is supported 2 to 4 sparsity. Okay, so after EIE, we uh, made an FPGA prototype to accelerate not only this FC layers, but also these recurrent neural nets, which is widely used in speech recognition, image caption, machine translation, and VQA. So let's talk about um, speech recognition. So previously, we do compression, and then we do accelerated inference on top of the compressed model. Okay, so we want to rethink the design flow whether when we are designing the accelerator, what should we do? Can we do better when we are doing pruning? Okay. Can we co-design the pruning algorithm versus the inference engine? Okay. So here we find load balancing is a very critical problem. Okay. So in this case, this green PE has how many non-zero entries? If, if it's dense, it should be four plus four, eight entries. But it is sparse. In this case, it has um, five entries, taking more cycle than the PE3, which has actually only one non zero element. Okay? So the total number of cycles is dependent on the largest PE, which has five non zero elements. So when we are doing pruning, this is telling us we should prune them such that each PE roughly has a similar amount of non-zero elements, rather than uh, this PE has to wait for this PE, right? So this is the guidance from the hardware to the pruning algorithm. So we want to run such low the balance aware pruning where each PE, we want to make sure they have roughly similar number of uh, non-zero elements. Okay? In this case, the green PE has one, two, three, there's three non-zero elements, similar for the orange and, the, and, the, and the others. And as a result, overall cycles is very well, very balanced. But this is extra constraint we have to add. Does it hurt the accuracy? That's really the case. So we did um, this analysis. This is without load balancing. So we can prune roughly 98% uh, of the parameters without significantly increasing the uh, uh, phone error rate. But if we apply this load balance aware pruning, we can still achieve a similar pruning ratio okay, without increasing uh, the error rate much. Okay? So by using such load balance aware pruning, it's quite uh, helpful. But comparing the speed up, remember when we are not load balanced, there will be some extra work. Uh, someone has to wait the so fast PEs has to wait for those slow PEs. Therefore, we have a 5x5x um, five five speed up. But if we have load balance aware pruning, we can actually have a higher speed up, 6.2x okay? speed up over the dense model. 
without hurting the accuracy. So this is really showing that uh, this algorithm hardware co-design where the hardware features actually guide a better software pruning, uh, the pruning algorithm will lead to a better speed up without changing the RTL. So this is exactly the same hardware, exactly the same uh, RTL, but can achieve a better speed up with a more properly pre uh, uh, pruned model, model architecture. So this is the overall building blocks, memory units, sparse matrix matrix multiplication units, and also these element-wise units. So this is prototyped uh, on this uh, PGA, okay, Linux KU60 PGA. Um, this is comparing the latency with the GPU and CPU. Those are back in 2016, so still past call Titan X, but now we have much better both uh, PGA and GPU. And the power is uh, power consumption versus speed up and energy efficiency. Such a specialized model is usually having a uh, higher utility, uh, higher uh, uh, power efficiency. But really, another uh, factor is super important for deep learning computing is the programmability, okay? and also um, how uh, how easy the software is to adapt to diverse different model architectures, right? So I want to show in this slide both the pros and cons for such specialized accelerator, right? This is back in, I designed this in uh, 2017, right? So later, actually one year later, these transformer models came out, right? BERT came out, okay? And the deep learning community is just evolving so fast, right? So programmability and adaptation capability and flexibility is super important. So when you are uh, dealing with uh, AI inference engine, AI chips, and AI hardware, this flexibility is the top thing to keep in mind um, uh, as a part with the efficiency and also the speed up. Okay? So this is, would be a good advice for not only the software, but also the chip designers. Uh, we want to make sure our models are, our uh, hardware, the silicon, is coupled with very well organized and, and, and easy to be adapted uh, the software stack, okay? All right, so let's fast forward to 2021, okay? Five years later, it's very exciting that the sparsity and pruning and model compression has landed in NVIDIA GPUs, okay? In the GPU, um, sparsity is now natively supported using a adapted version, which is M and sparsity. And what is MN sparsity? In this case, this is two to four sparsity. So in every four element, okay, in every four element as a group, at least two of them has to be zero. Okay? You can have three zeros, you can have four zeros, but you have to at least have two then zero uh, two zero element. Okay? So this is for the first block. And similarly for the second block, we have two uh, middle points that is non-zero and all the, uh, the other two is zero. Um, two, two out of four are zero. Two out of four are, are zero. So every um, uh, four elements, we have at least two, uh, nine, uh, two zeros. So that is two to four sparsity. And how do we represent that? So we can condense these eight entries into only four entries. And since two to four sparsity, we can have two, uh, or at most four non-zero elements. And we have to store the, the index, okay? The index for each element, okay? Whether this element can come from uh, four locations, zero, one, two, three. And we need to store two bits for each non-zero element indicating where they are. For example, for this one, um, we have to store zero since it is in the first location. For this one, we'll store three since it's in the last location. Um, that's why we need two bits per entry to store the index, the location, for um, each non-zero indices. Okay? So just a quick question. For this element, what, what should be its index for this element? Yeah, actually it's one, right? And this is two, right? So zero, one, two, three. And 
you are storing two bits indicating its position. And how do we accelerate that? It's very smart. It's very smart in NVIDIA GPU to support such two to four sparsity. Dense case, sparse case. For the dense case, you can have a pruned model. This is the weight, this is the activation. You have to do eight uh, multiplications. Okay, you accumulate them to get this input A matrix. This is the B matrix. Okay, you multiply them together. You get this row, multiply this by this column. You get this entry, right? This is the basics of matrix multiplication. You have eight numbers, eight numbers. You have to do eight multiplications and eight additions. That's the traditional scenario, right? Eight. So what about the updated version? For this weight matrix, we are no longer storing uh, the, in the original format, but in the sparse format. Okay? Out of these eight, only four of them are non-zero together with this index. So we put them here. Um, for the first operand, we put it in the four non-zeros. And for the corresponding activations, we want to have the exact same sparsity pattern since zero multiplied by anything is zero. So you see uh, non-zero, okay, zero, zero, non-zero. Similar here, non zero, 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 non zero. So we want to pick the corresponding element by using this index, right? So in here, uh, what should be the uh, index? For example, this non zero element, this is zero, one, two, three. Zero, one, two, three. So the index is actually zero and three in this case. So here we are storing zero and three. We use that as a selection to select the zero and the three from the activation, okay, so that um, these two are skipped. Out of these eight elements, only four of them are selected using um, these two bits for each, each one. Okay? So therefore, we can just multiply these four numbers with these four numbers, put them, uh, accumulate them together, and get the final output. Okay? Very smart. Eight numbers now becomes only four numbers that we need to add, uh, uh, multiply and accumulate. Okay, save you theoretically, save you eight, uh, half of the cycles. Okay. Any questions on the data flow? How NVIDIA supports sparsity? What is the cost of the index? Actually, the, this is pure combinational logic. Right, um, very little data movement. Okay, so uh, such things can be uh, completed within like one cycle or something. So it should be very low cost. But those numbers are not if the matrix has even a single case where there's more than two non-zero values in a given vector, is it completely invalid and can't use any of it, or? Uh, um, and it will be ignored, right? So you have, if you have more, three nine zeros, okay, um, then we only have the capacity to store half of the entries. So during pruning, you want to make sure the software engineer will prune the model such that you have at least uh, two nine zeros, uh, two at, at most, sorry, at least two zeros out of four entries. Yeah, you can do two to four, like three to six, three to nine, etc. Um, so far, I'm only aware of two to four, since four is friendly, uh, where you have um, it's two to the power of two, right? If you have three over nine, then it's hard to make it bite, bite aligned. Um, but of course, I think you can, you can have more aggressive, like two to eight sparsity, if you can have better pruning algorithm to make sure you have a more aggressive pruning, but also well-maintained accuracy. Um, the larger the N, the, easier, the harder to maintain the accuracy, but the higher the potential to have more speed up. So that's the trade-off. Does the entire model have to be pruned to two or four sparsity? Can you have like particular layers? I thought you were saying something that 
some layers they can hold that. Oh, sorry, so what's the question again? Is, is it possible to have like a, some subset of the models accelerated with sparse calculation while the rest don't uh, have the full sparsity and have to take full calculation? Yeah, there? of course. Yeah, so A100 support both sparse and dense operation. If some layers are dense, you can, of course, use the original uh, methods to accelerate to, 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 to run that. That's totally possible. Actually, the first layer of a neural net is sometimes it's harder to prune. So sometimes people to choose to run it in dense format. All right, that's a lot of good questions. So there's another good example to observe what's the difference between the first academic prototype and also the industry product, right? And how exciting it is, the short amount of time from 2015 where the paper is out versus in 2021, you can actually get a physical silicon in production. Isn't it very cool? So this is showing the speed up for the uh, GMM. So this is sweeping over the K dimension. So MK times K to N. And we can observe the larger the K, the higher the speed up. And saturates at about two, since it's two to four sparsity, you save uh, at most two X. And on the right hand side is showing the uh, the accuracy across different uh, different models, mostly uh, vision models, and the accuracy is actually well maintained um, using the sparse version versus the dense version. And why two to four? That's also one reason is due to we want to want to fully maintain the accuracy rather than two to six or two to eight sparsity. All right, so summarize uh, today's lecture. Uh, we learned about automated ways to find the pruning ratio, right? Very practical method is used in the sensitivity analysis. And we uh, discussed this fun part, which is the lottery ticket hypothesis. Um, both of these uh, uh, directions could be a good uh, direction for your final project, right? Continue exploring either of these directions. And also we discussed this system support for, uh, for sparsity. In the next lecture, uh, we will talk about, about quantization, another very important concept in efficient deep learning. First, introducing those data types, FP16, what is FP8, FP16, in 8 and basic concepts of network quantization and common quantization methods. And here are today's uh, references for today's pa the papers we covered today. And that's all for today's lecture. Thank you.